Hi, how are you? I'm well. How are you? Good, good. Looks Thanks. sunny there. Uh, I guess it's sort of like marine layer haze. It's okay. Yeah. How is it by you? Cold? Cold and overcast, and it's going to be this way for several months. <laughs> I used to live in Chicago. I lived there for about 14 years. So I remember those winters more than I would like to. I feel sorry for you. Uh, yeah, thank you. I was <laughs> I was looking at your site um, and maybe we can take a moment um, and do a little introductions. But yeah, I noticed that you have some clinicians who are working in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, for people who don't know you, who might be on my side, can you tell us who you are? Of course. Yes, thank you for that. Um, I'm Dr. Kate Balistrieri. I'm a licensed psychologist, certified sex therapist, and the founder of Modern Intimacy, which is a group psychotherapy practice that does have providers in five different states. Illinois is one of them. New York, Colorado, California, and Florida also. Awesome. And what kind of services, mm -hmm. uh, if I were looking for anything, could I come to for you or come to you for? Sure. So my team and I uh, can work with folks for individual therapy, couples therapy, sex therapy. We work with a lot of people who are healing from different kinds of trauma. So that can include intimate partner violence or developmental traumas, um, of course, sexual trauma, all the other kinds that we might endure. Uh, so we work with a lot of folks who um, are in various stages of healing and various stages of learning to thrive. Okay, awesome. Um, and I don't know if I'm popping up on someone's For You page or for your guests. Uh, I'm Laura, Laura Danger. I'm an educator. I am a coach and I facilitate uh, using the fair play method, which is essentially a home equity and division of labor system so that you can effectively communicate about all of the things that build a life. So, um, and people might know me from popularizing the term weaponized incompetence. And so that's why we are talking today. Mm -hmm. um, and you have so much experience and expertise that I, I think is so important to this conversation. Um, one of the biggest questions that I had for you, well, I have a lot of questions for you. Mm -hmm. um, but one of them was, you know, weaponized incompetence is a broad term. When you hear that word, what do you think of? Yeah, um, I think when, when I hear the term weaponized incompetence, I think about somebody who is feigning ignorance or doing something in a subpar way intentionally so that they can really get out of being expected to do that task in the future. So it can take many different shapes and forms, but Really, it's it's a it's a manipulation tactic that is designed to lighten their load and put the burden of that work into the lap of the other person. So when we're talking about home life, that typically ends up being their partner. Yeah. <laughs> How do you define? I, it? Uh, very similarly. Very similarly. Um, I'm just I'm thinking of specific examples and. As the holidays are coming up, um, I'm seeing a lot more videos on this. And a lot of times I see them really normalizing the behavior, which is, you know, not knowing how to buy gifts, not knowing how to do how to cook, um, mm -hmm. not taking care of the kids so that she, she, it's usually a, ge a very gendered heteronormative dynamic, um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I see a lot of examples of it. And um, I've been thinking a lot about it in sitcoms lately. Oh. So the one example is uh, Everybody Loves Raymond, when mm -hmm. he would like not intentionally not unpack the suitcase because, or, or pack the suitcase because they forgot important things and he didn't want to have to do that again in the future. And of course, it's a laugh track laid on top of this situation. <laughs> Everybody Loves Raymond is one of my favorite shows for so many reasons, but it really depicts weaponized incompetence beautifully. And and you're so right. It's across so many different kinds of sitcoms. And we've sort of as a culture developed this like dumb, bumbly husband sort of trope who gets away with things because he's cute and affable and just doesn't know any better. 
But weaponized incompetence has roots in a, a pretty tremendously egregious systemic form of oppression, gender-based oppression, because while it can happen for folks of all genders and from all sexual orientations, from all backgrounds, um, and in all different kinds of relationship orientations, we do see a disproportionate amount of gender-based weaponized incompetence in cishet relationships, specifically because of the way that rigid gender roles have decided and have um, affirmed and reaffirmed uh, time and time again that certain kinds of work is women's work and certain kinds of work is men's work. And so there's really been um, a deprioritization of a lot of domestic labor and emotional labor. And so this sort of like bumbly, affable, get out of work free card is not only to be expected, but it's sort of rewarded by folks who adhere to these more rigid gender role, um, you know, models of being in relationship because then everyone's playing their part, right? Mm. Except it's a system that doesn't really work for one partner. And I would argue for either partner in the long run. That's so interesting that you say that, that it's rewarded. Um, and as you're saying that, I'm thinking it's kind of rewarded <laughs> on both sides, on <laughs> all sides, I should say, of the gender spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because like transgressing that, it's, it's still a transgression <laughs> to see, um, like when my husband takes the kids to school, you know, things like that. But um, can you, I, I would love for you to elaborate, like, what is that, what are you getting when you subscribe to these norms and when you buy into this, like, bumbling fool dad or, like, silly goofy or mom who does all of it? Yeah. What, what is going on there? Why is it that okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> I don't really think that it's conscious for a lot of people. Um, I really think that a lot of the way people show up in relationships is part of an, uncon an unconscious conditioning process in, in which we learn who we're supposed to be by being given these different scripts. And so a lot of what's happening in relationships is, of course, interpersonal um, dynamics. But we have to remember that it's also a place through which a lot of folks define their identity. And so when people participate in these different kinds of gender role, uh, I'll call them foreclosures, right? I'm a woman, therefore I must, or I'm a man, therefore I must. When they've got this foreclosed path on who they should be, not only can it <clears throat> create tension in their relationship, but it can also create tension between how they experience themselves and how they feel like they should experience themselves. And that sort of existential tension or that sort of internal loyalty bind, uh, you know, should I be true to myself or true to who I think I should be, is the source of a lot of tension and frustration for people. And when we're presented with that dissonance, we usually gravitate towards what conserves the most mental energy. And for a lot of people, that's a regression back into these prescribed gender roles. Wow. Wow. That is so interesting. Um, I know that I, when I became a mother, we very unintentionally slipped into these gender roles that I never, I never in a million years would have thought we would have done. Um, and that is such an interesting thing. Yeah, it was, it was very acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, and I was noticing on, on my side of TikTok where it's like a lot of mommy creators and, and um, things like that, a lot of parenting content. Mm -hmm. Um, it is really glorified. And what I find really interesting is it's, it's, you see this, this tide, the tides are changing and people are starting to like talk more about how the actual weight of these gender dynamics are, um, harmful, but there is still this, like that confirmation, that self-confirmation, like, yes, this is really hard. And this is where we have defaulted to, but. I feel strong because I do this. And there's like this framing to make us stay there. It, what is, is that coping? Is it, how, how do we undo that? Great questions. Um, well, I think it really speaks to first, this idea of um, exceptionalism. And when I use that term in this construct, what I'm really 
sort of honing in on is that a lot of folks will be big champions of ideas around equality. Yes, equality is great. It benefits everyone, all the things we need progress, la la la. And I do think that they consciously want that. And also when I say exceptionalism, what I mean is it's good for everybody in general, <laughs> but we resort back to these implicitly developed scripts about what is good for us. And so much of what, so much of how we develop as humans is unconscious and it's based on the encoding of the behaviors of the people around us. So we see our parents act a certain way and unconsciously, we have this idea of that's how people should be or parents should be or partners should be. And so it's not always a conscious thing when people are having this sort of dissonant experience of yes, progress and equality, but also my wife should do that because that's what women do. And in fact, um, even though we are seeing that so many more women are making as much, if not more money as their male counterparts in partnership, when those women are out earning their male partners, they tend to shore an even higher burden of domestic and emotional labor at home because there is sometimes a conscious, but often an unconscious resentment that is um, at the helm of the male partner and a guilt at the helm mm. of the male partner. Um, and so there's like this unconscious gravitational pull to like make sure to maintain the status quo because that's what we do, even though it's not what we do. That's so interesting. Yeah, it's almost like I know I I know I grew up with um, the idea that I should be self reliant mm -hmm. and I should be able to bear the burden of it all, and so I definitely relate to what you were talking about when I was the the primary earner, and also feeling like I had to prioritize my kids at the end of the day, and I'm just making myself feel very depleted because I felt as if I was taking away from my kids by being the primary breadwinner. And it was like, Oh, what a mess. That's been a lot of, that's been a lot of work um, to mm -hmm. undo. But you mentioned something really specific. Um, you said that, you know, like a lot of us fall into these roles unintentionally. And, you know, that was like what it was like in my household. My husband, it was a really, really good helper. And we still had this imbalance and resentment happening. And we would continue I'm very guilty of being a martyr, self martyring, and taking on more than I should or could. So, um, at what point, and thankfully, weaponized incompetence wasn't in the way that we're talking about wasn't a thing in my partnership. Mm -hmm. um, but there was this role, we'd fall into roles, and one of us would feel responsible and the other wouldn't. Where does it cross over into, uh, you know, that was an unintentional behavior that once addressed, we were able to, you know, solve the problem the best we can. Mm -hmm. When does it actually become weaponized incompetence and like a tool of harm? That's a great question. <clears throat> I don't think that we can look at a definitive line in the sand and say, when people do this, that means it's this. Um in terms of whether or not it's abusive. But if we look sort of, we can look at this from two perspectives. There's the systemic aspect of weaponized incompetence that is abusive no matter what, because it relies on the exploitation of the free labor of someone else in the relationship. And when we're talking about weaponized incompetence across gender dynamics in cishet relationships, often it is a tool of the patriarchy to keep women in uh, positions where they are dependent on a partner and exhausted by, by the relationship and therefore unable to organize and step into their own power in a way that feels really autonomous and <clears throat> effectual in their lives. Um, however, in interpersonal relationships, I would say that it is a lot more nuanced because there is such a lack of consciousness around so much of how we are in relationship. So while it definitely can be exploitative, it isn't always intended for that to be the case. And I think sometimes, you know, what I hear from a lot of men in cishet relationships is, I thought that my partner wanted to maintain control of the house. I thought I was punting 
because that's where her power is. I thought I was, you know, sharing power by, by playing dumb or by not getting involved. And sometimes I believe them. And sometimes I think that's more weaponized incompetence coming through in the conversation. But I do think that there are some men who really do feel like I don't want to step on my wife's toes. And so I'll help, I'll take her, um, I'll take her directives, I'll show up when she needs me, but this is sort of her world and I want to honor that. And so I think we have to be really clear at looking at motivation. And one of the things that comes up for me and sort of understanding that line between is it incompetence or is it abuse is, has the partner expressed a desire for it to be different? And that desire has gone unheard, minimized, or um, just denied. Yeah. What that's okay. So I also work with couples. I, I work with couples who come to me for fair play specifically. And so the people that walk through my virtual door, you know, someone has invited them to the table and said, here is this system of communication. Here's a tool. We are both on the same page. We want to fix this. Um, and more often than not, like we learn the tools, we coach through it. It, it goes quite well. The, you notice a difference. Um, but I also get calls from people and I don't usually take these clients. I usually refer them out to a fair play informed clinician, but I get a lot of people who come to me and say, how do I get my partner? I've begged, I begged for years <laughs> for them to participate at home and just do the dishes or want to show up for these things what do I do? And I'll usually say, I don't think, I don't think I can help you with that. What, if somebody came to you and asked mm -hmm. that, what do you think you would say to them? Well, I, I, first of all, I work with couples all the time and that's the scenario. One couple or one partner is really motivated for some sort of change to happen. And the other partner is digging in their heels for whatever reason. And so I tend to look at that resistance as a form of protection what might that partner be trying to protect themselves from? And more often than not, there is an entitlement piece that says, I shouldn't have to do this labor. I shouldn't have to do those things because that's what we, meaning that partner, has decided is the right way to approach the relationship and the division of, of labor that comes with being in a relationship. Um, so we have to first look at what's the protection. And usually... It's in the form of, I don't want to have to work any harder because I already work so hard. And that quantification, first of all, is often faulty and erroneous because the kind of labor that's done at home is also fatiguing, exhausting. And when we look at the amount of labor done at home, it's usually the equivalent of two and a half full-time jobs outside the home. So when there's a partner working outside the home and they're having this sort of entitled uh, position at home, one of the first things that I do is is have them do a little bit of reality testing around how much vacation time comes with being the domestic engineer, <laughs> how many uh, breaks are they awarded, uh, is this ethical by the employment standards in their state, and that can sometimes be the first start of an entry point into chiseling through the entitlement, and in doing that, what I'm really looking for is some motivation on their part. Right? How can I incite motivation? Because sometimes it's not enough to see their partner in a lot of pain because they have rigid ideas about who should be doing what. And so in their mind, being asked to do something more is an injustice, but they've not really thought it through in a way that really uh, suggests that they're thinking about their partnership as its own system. And so when we start to look at partnership as its own entity, and then we have each individual in the partnership, you can start to create motivation because what's good for my partner is good for the system. And what's good for the system is good for me. And that mm. can take a bit of um, education to help people see. But once people get it, then they're usually more apt to have a more equitable conversation. Okay, very, mm, I like that. Do you, at what point, I know, you know, part of the question that we're trying to, to talk about today is all of the nuance involved in weaponizing competence and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, 
at what point, you know, some of these videos go viral or we hear about things, we meet people. At what point do you think it does? Do you think people could say, oh, this, this feels like abuse? What are some, are there any hard and fast lines? I know you kind of said there aren't, but well, I, yeah. what does that make you think of? <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there definitely are some like, hard and fast lines where we could say abuse is happening. So that could be whenever there is, um, you know, aggression, physical aggression, emotional aggression, financial aggression. And we see that a lot over coupled with weaponized incompetence and entitlement. So these players in the game are not usually alone, right? Some of the behaviors come with others. But I do think that we have to remember that every coupleship is responsible for the agreements within that coupleship. And so some partners might say, now because it's their preference or they're adhered to a specific identity, you know, we, I, won't, I won't try to suppose I know everyone's motive for feeling this way, but there are some partners who say, nope, that's my job, that's my responsibility. I wanna take all of that and I don't want my partner to have to do those things. That's okay. And so in, in situations like that, I would say these are probably agreements that have been implicitly or explicitly made. For me, where it starts to get abusive is when one partner has said, I am drowning. I need your help. I need you to participate in creating agreements, right, that feel equitable to us both. And when you have a partner who's not willing to participate in that conversation and not willing to step up in the ways they're being asked, and it's a repeated conversation, that to me feels very much like abuse. Okay, so part of a pattern, right? Mm -hmm. Repeated. Um, my friend Jamila likes, she makes wonderful con content and something she says is she makes content for people so they can't say they didn't know. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that um, to your point about, it's, it's feigned ignorance, it's, mm -hmm. um, what I like to say about my understanding of weaponized incompetence is um, it's not showing up in good faith. Yeah. It's, do you really mean that you didn't know that? And now that I'm saying it, are you, are you willing to then show up and talk about this? Um, Cause yeah, it's like to me and, and as not an expert, when I start to get like the tingly feeling where I'm thinking, this is really, this feels dangerous. This feels violent this feels bad is when someone is making they're feeling ill they're mm -hmm. neglecting their own health the children are not safe there's and to me when it's you know we see these viral videos where it's like i'm sick again and i have to take care of the kids again because he's not doing anything and it's not one off it's right. not oh we both have the flu and this time and, but, but where it gets complicated for what you just said is when there is an agreement, sometimes I feel like there's influence from your culture, your church, your, In your parents, mm -hmm. the script that you've inherited that says that moms mm -hmm. sacrifice their health and they sacrifice their wellness. Mm -hmm. And so it's so hard for me to... To, I, I have a really hard time understanding the line. Mm -hmm. I feel like I would know it for myself, but I don't know what advice could you give someone if they're trying to, if they're starting to question, Yeah, am I doing this to myself? Is this the abuse of the system or is this interpersonal? That's a great question. And I think sometimes it's all three of those things, right? It is the abuse of the system. It is interpersonal. And then it becomes a pattern of self-protection, actually, to take on the labor instead of continuing to be in conflict with your partner who's not willing to show up in the ways that you've asked. So I think one, one plug that I would like to put out there is a book that was written by Emily Nagowski and her sister, whose name is escaping me right now. So I'm sorry about that if the authors are listening, um, but it's called Burnout. And it's a yeah, fantastic- I've heard of that. Oh, great read. It's a great read. And in it, she talks about um, a concept that is probably not going to be new for anyone listening, um, but it's from Kate Mann's book, Down Girl, which talks about systemic misogyny and 
um, sexism and the ways that it impacts women negatively. And so Emily Nagowski points out that women are conditioned to be human givers and men are conditioned to be human beings. So they will receive all of the giving that women are conditioned to pour out of themselves sometime until there's nothing left to give. So what advice I might offer is one, read burnout. It's a really great book. Um, but two, if you're feeling exhausted, say something to your partner, to your other support people, um, get help. Because what we know is that the institution of marriage benefits men tremendously. It does not benefit women in the same ways. And um, actually, Gabor Mate's book, When the Body Says No, is another great example of how the research shows that the ways in which women are conditioned to give and conditioned to be martyrs as a demonstration of their worthiness as women can lead to tremendous health costs, mental health costs, and the deterioration of their bodies, where their body literally starts shutting down because they cannot or will not vocalize a no. Wow. Yeah, that's so, so many, so many women specifically that I know that I see on here, um, women in my own social circle, especially coming up as a new mother, um, encouraged each other to become more efficient mm -hmm. at life, rather than push back. And I think at least for me, that was um, a hard experience to have, because I thought, like, wow, this is really hard. Like, mm -hmm. this is really, really hard. And I don't feel like I can become more efficient. Like I just feel like I'm going to burn myself out. But everybody else in my life is just telling me to just get better at doing it all. Um, how, how can we support one another instead of blame? You know, I felt it was my own fault. Like how can we, how can cre we create a healthier environment? Well, I really appreciate you bringing that up because I think that that's one of the really epically insidious ways that women are blamed for everything. And while sure, most of us could stand to improve our efficiency in some ways, we don't sign up to get married to our community in order to help us have children. We pick a partner and have children with a partner and most women have the belief that their partner is going to be a participant in that process. That's the story that most women are told. You meet someone, you fall in love, they take care of you, they provide, blah, 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 all the things that we're told. And that means really different things to different people, of course. But it's not a coincidence that the majority of women end up in relationships going, where's my partner? I need a partner, not an additional child. And this dynamic that gets set up and the different expectations that are told to men and women in cishet relationships really sets both parties up for distress and frustration because they're not getting their needs met. They, are not, they don't know how to communicate those needs without betraying those roles, right, or their identity in them. And so it can be really tricky. So it's so important to you know, get shored up by community. But also, I think we have to name the problem for what it is. Women are being gaslit into indentured servitude. And so if you are someone who feels exhausted, it's because you are, and not because you're a bad person, but because it's impossible for one person to be the complete engineer of all things, domestic and relational. And many single moms who I talk to talk about how much easier it is because they don't have this sort of competing pushback of their partner who wants to have a say, but not a part. And that's a really frustrating space to be in for a lot of women. That, that part right there, I have heard family members of my mine have said, you know, I, I, you know, my spouse, will travel and prioritize their work and then come home and want to tell me how to parent or suddenly tell me like what kind of dinner they want to have when you have, where have you been? Right. What, what investment have you put into this partnership that right. makes you feel like you have a say here? Right. Um, and of course that was like after they were divorced and I was hearing the frustration. Um, but that is another really important thing, you know, express your needs, understand that this might not be 
your individual faults. We exist within a society that teaches us these things. But something that um, I've learned over the last year and a half talking about this online is I no longer connect the videos that I talk about to the person Mm -hmm. because immediately I noticed that people from my comment section will go there and say, divorce, divorce, dump him, Mm -hmm. run. And that raises, like, I feel really uncomfortable with that personally, but I'm, I'm wondering how you feel about when that happens in comment sections. Well, I think people want easy answers, right? And when, when I watch a lot of your content and I see the clips that you comment on, I immediately resonate with how helpless the, the person in the video probably feels. And I think a lot of the rest of your audience does too. And none of us really like to feel helpless. So we jump to these easy black and white solutions of dump him, leave him, you deserve better. I mean, we all deserve a relationship that is fair and equitable and based in justice um, and collaboration. But it's just not always so easy to leave, first of all. Um, There may be other really wonderful parts of the relationship that somebody wants to hold on to. And we shouldn't have to be put in a decision where we have to choose between getting a divorce or our partner helping you know, be an active part of managing the household. Ideally, that is what we're signing up for, right? And that that feels like a really unfair thing to say to people who are likely trying to make the best out of a situation that's imperfect, like every relationship is. Yeah. You point to you point to something that I think about all of the time, and I think that you and I feel very similarly about, which is um, you mentioned in the, you mentioned it in the beginning of the patriarchy. And um, anytime I talk about weaponized incompetence, my brain always goes back to who's benefiting. And of course, interpersonally, it's often the person who's doing less domestic labor, but I think it goes all the way to the top. And oh. it's like the layers the layers of white supremacy and patriarchy and capitalism and ultimately imperialism yes. all benefit from these dynamics. And I guess I, it just always like, why do we keep putting ourselves in these situations and why would it be hard to leave? That's the, the systems have created this like self you want to stay because of the security and they're the policies that cause it's hard to get health insurance or childcare or housing. And mm-hmm. I don't know what, I know you've got thoughts on this too. <laughs> well, I'll echo everything that you said, right? These systems are designed with intention to keep certain people at the top of the hierarchy of power and to keep others at the bottom. And those at the top depend on the exploitation of those everywhere else along the hierarchy. And um, depending on intersectionally the different identities that you hold, you may be higher or lower on that hierarchy of power, but everyone is being exploited, especially the folks who are on the lower end of this hierarchy. So make no mistake, it's intentional. And until we as a society start challenging these systemic oppressions and start demanding change, which we do have the power to do as a group, it's very difficult as one person, but as a group, we have the power to make change. And we're in, I think, a really important moment in our zeitgeist where we are stepping up and saying, no more, no more, please and thank you, we're done now. Let's do something different. And so whenever we reach those bubbling moments in a culture, we can expect to see tremendous pushback and we can expect to see a rage against people standing up and an even more forceful and insidious um, conversation about why those roles or why the people in the lower spots on the hierarchy should stay in them. So we're seeing that now in a lot of like the the repurposed and repackaged conversations about masculinity and femininity and the stay at home girlfriends and the, um, 
the you know romanticization of the traditional housewives all of that make no mistake is repackaged patriarchy that is funneled through new and more innovative innovative channels so that it looks different and people who maybe would have been more um, aligned with a different mentality might say oh well this feels palatable when somebody who you know, is saying it so, so nicely says it, right? It doesn't feel oppressive if it's my choice, right? Um, mm -hmm. So we're, we're getting there, but I think I lost track of your original question. I no, that's, I, there wasn't a direct question. I, I think you make that a couple months ago, <clears throat> I made a post about choice feminism. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, I, a lot of the women um, and primary caregivers who come to me are, primary caregivers they're doing a lot more of the domestic labor and to your point a lot of them feel very fulfilled and they connect their identity to that work and I, I made a pretty controversial um, post about how like you may feel comfortable and confident in your partnership and cared for systemically however this is still not you don't have a choice. There is still not actual choice, especially to your point, based on your intersecting identities and where you lie within the forced hierarchy. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it does feel like there's a, a collective move toward forward movement about valuing care. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it, it feels good, but I, I also want to very specifically acknowledge that I think it's because white women are saying it and, and women of color have, have been saying this. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that a lot of what I'm saying comes from reading literature and listening to women of color. And I can continue to, point back to the books and the authors and the theorists that have taught me. Mm -hmm. But as with everything, listening to the most oppressed, and of course, like the single black mothers are, that's who we need to be listening to always, because always. we are protected as mm -hmm. white women. Mm -hmm. um, I'm protected as a white woman, as a cisgendered, hetero presenting white woman by so many layers of privilege that I even get to sit on an afternoon and talk mm -hmm. about this. So that. Uh. No, I, I mean, we, we cannot as members of privileged groups, we cannot have the knowledge that those in the marginalized groups have because our privilege protects us from it. Um, it also is a huge disservice that we are protected from that knowledge, but it is the design of these oppressive systems to keep some people um, out of the awareness and to keep those people vying for their own proximity to the power that feels closer because of their intersecting identities. So it is really important that we as white women do claim the benefits, and I don't mean claim them as in celebrate them, but acknowledge the benefits of the privilege, um, but also work really, really hard to understand the wisdom of folks who have a much more robust understanding of these topics than we do because of our privilege. Yeah. 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 Um, Mickey Kendall wrote Hood Feminism, and that was a really, really important book for me. Um, recently on this topic um, because of she does a really great job breaking down how how white women will support their husbands and vote to benefit their husbands because it protects the way that they have been told that they will have security in life mm -hmm. which is to stay home and and it there are so many layers to why white women continue to vote in a way that harms so many yes. because of these lies that we're told about mm -hmm how we get free. We don't get free in this system. We don't get free until we're all free, which is why we need to listen to women of color. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's unbelievable how many layers there are. And I, I want to come back to the point about abuse and the many ways, you know, all of this causes harm, inequity in relationships, blatant interpersonal 
purposeful weaponized incompetence and neglect, minimizing Mm -hmm. all of that. Um, But if you are feeling, if you are feeling like that is the situation they are in and you are trying to get out of it, I know we identified, you know, bring it up Mm -hmm. explicitly. Um, I would say talking to safe enough to bring it up. There are some circumstances where someone might not feel safe. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I do think that's an important point of clarification because they don't want to put that burden on people who are being victimized by an abusive system in addition to weaponized incompetence. They don't want to make that their ability to put themselves in more danger. That's such a good point. And that's, that's what I was going to get to is, um, if someone is trying to get out of this situation and they don't, they just feel helpless and, you know, it can feel, I'm, I'm really purposeful with my language when I talk because I want, I want people to recognize that this is harmful Mm -hmm. for all of the reasons that we're talking about, which is like, you might, you might be doing this to yourself. You might be following a script to, to your words. Um, you might, feel pressure from your family, all of these reasons that we fall into these dynamics and accept this behavior and laugh at it on sitcoms and um, being faced with the harm can be shocking. Mm -hmm. And once somebody discovers that they are the victim of harmful behaviors and a harmful dynamic, is there anything we can do like very practically some steps we could provide them or advice? Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. Well, I think one, I really want to honor what you just said. um, And I'll, I'll maybe add a little um, additional framework to it. Once you start to see all of this behavior, you can't unsee it, first of all. And seeing things like weaponized incompetence, get a laugh track in a sitcom. I understand that, you know, art imitates life sometimes and we laugh at the absurd because we need that comic relief because it is so absurd. But really when you start to see it as problematic and you really start to see all of the ways in which these, um, systems operate in the world, it can create a tremendous amount of fear and a tremendous amount of grief because the world as you understood it to be doesn't exist that way. And really starting to deconstruct these these systems of oppression and something like weaponized incompetence. I'll help, I'll, I will hear people all the time say things like, it's not that deep. Well, it might not be deep to you because you're not thinking about it in a deep way. But the reality is it's incredibly deep and nuanced, and it does penetrate our psyches in a way that most people don't think about, because if they did, they would fall into despair. But the despair is necessary, because once we can move through the the anger and the grief that comes with recognizing these behaviors, then we can galvanize into action. And action is where we can make changes individually, interpersonally, and collectively, So I would say it's a necessary process to be angry, to be sad, to even feel hopeless at times. And that is the necessary input that fosters in people's minds options for change and momentum to get there. So what it looks like in reality might be educating yourself first. Read as much as you can about these topics. Learn about kind of your own place and and your own starting line in this world and sort of how that's influenced who you are today and the loyalties that you maintain with your partner with yourself with your family of origin with your idea of culture or religion i mean it's not just our identity as a woman or as a man or as a partner that sometimes gets challenged it's our identity as a person of this descent or of that background right we have a lot of intersecting identities that really get protective, you know, when we start to deconstruct this stuff. And then I would say create other community with other like-minded folks, because this this gets really lonely when you really start challenging the status quo. Um, because for many people, they'll realize that there's not a place for them in a family system or in a relationship with people who aren't also willing to question and make changes. And so 
Often people will need to make the very difficult decision to put some space between themselves and the people they love, and that can be really painful too. So creating other community um, not only can help shore up some safety if you do decide to make changes or leave a relationship, but it also is really food for the soul when you're trying to not feel so alone in the world. Yeah. Wow. Well, okay. I think, I think we should end on that note if you're okay with it. I, that's just such a brilliant wrap up um, to this really important conversation. Um, I mean, I'm forever thankful for your wisdom and this, this collaboration and connection and this conversation is so important. I'm so grateful to be a part of, it feels like there's an online community, even if you can't find it in per person, at least, you know, follow people who are talking about these things and questioning and learning. Um, I, do you have a book recommendation? Like if you could just say one book to start, is there one? Mm, well, to start what, which part? To start questioning, to start um, learning about how we might be affected by um, the systems. I don't know. The question, the curious to change their life a little bit. Yeah. There's one book and the author is escaping me now, but it's called something like Fix the Systems, Not the Women. Ooh. Yeah. And and that's a really important book because it, it looks at the ways in which women get blamed, victim blamed and minimized all over the place and really addresses the way we should think more systemically about the problems in our world. So that's a great book to start. Um, I really love Down Girl by Kate Mann. It's a little bit more dense, um, but it's a great primer to understand the insidious mechanisms of misogyny and sexism and just how pervasive they are throughout our everyday life. Um, what are some of your favorites? I think those are great. The most recent one that I read, um, and it's a little bit different. It's it's called Essential Labor. Sorry, mm -hmm. Essential Labor by Angela Garbus. I think that's how you say it. Let's see, um, Garbus. Um, it's a, it's about the value of domestic labor, mm -hmm. um, and I think the other one that really changed my perspective on mostly my ability or my, the necessity of receiving care mm -hmm. was How We Show Up by Mia mm -hmm. Birdsong mm -hmm. to just like, maybe it, it's less systemic and more um, the interpersonal side. So I'm guessing like the both of all of those working together might, might kick your butt into doing something that you really need to do for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you doing the work that you do and helping to educate folks. I mean, I, I know your content um, helped enrich my awareness on weaponized incompetence and bring it back into the foreground in my own life, but also in the work that I do with couples. And um, I frequently recommend Fair Play as a book for folks to kind of get themselves recentered, you know, from a position of equity, because we often forget that a two person relationship is the smallest social experience that we can have and therefore social justice starts in our most tender relationships and when we can start there and create equity and fairness and justice um, then we can affect change in the system too i love it okay well thank you so much for joining me thank you to everybody in the comments who stuck around it sounds like a lot of people i just from scrolling really enjoyed the content here. Um, and if you're not following Dr. Kate, please get on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And also to my community, thank you. I've been seeing your comments come through and, and I really appreciate the dialogue here. And um, definitely follow Laura if you don't already. Her content is transformative. And thank you again for this conversation. So I appreciate it so much. All right, everybody. Have a great day. Bye. See ya.